So it's a, it's a soulful pleasure for me to get to do this last capsule, <clears throat> this last module, sharing with you something that's basically my life's work. And I've been evolving this and working on this for 20 years. It took me 20 years to write the book, and I just published the book last year. <clears throat> and it's pretty exciting, I think. I'm biased, obviously. But it's pretty exciting work. And it is a conceptualization, a treatment protocol for treating trauma forward-facing going forward. And it utilizes all the active ingredients of, trauma, uh, of effective traumatic uh, stress treatment and doing that in a way that produces immediate change. Not waiting till we've worked through the traumas, but immediately resolving the trauma of the past by working here in the present and immediately having better quality of life. I'd like to share this with you and um, what I believe is that even if you are going to go back and work through childhood sexual abuse memories, that you want to be doing forward-facing trauma therapy between sessions, that this is a, a, an ancillary process that can continue alongside of whatever other therapy methods that you're doing to maximize your client's growth and, and uh, accelerate treatment. So I want to talk a little bit about it first. Um, there's a copy, a cover of the book, um, and I want to draw your attention to, um, and I just, uh, just last week I've spent a bunch of time on the phone with the attorneys and uh, just registered the forward-facing trauma therapy uh, trademark. So I've trademarked this because um, it's something different. And um, I want you to notice the subtitle of the book, Healing the Moral Wound. What the heck's that mean? And before we get into the process of how to do forward-facing trauma therapy, I want to talk about that for a second. And that's one of the most insidious pieces, I think, of traumatic stress is the demoralization that happens as a result of trauma. And there's really two moral wounds that come with trauma. There is an acute moral wounding and there's a chronic moral wounding. The acute moral wounding happens at the time of the trauma. It's people that have never been traumatized. They have um, what, uh, what Ronnie General Bullman called an assumptive world. That we have these assumptions, this schema, that the world's basically a good place, that we can get our needs met, that people are basically good, that if I work hard, I will be rewarded. You know, those kind of basic assumptions of the world. And after we get traumatized, that is blown up. And the world becomes a dangerous place. Um, I cannot get my needs met. Uh, people are bad and dangerous, and I am weak and, and damaged is that there's that shoo, shattering of all that. But even more insidious is what happens hour to hour, day to day, in the life of a trauma survivor. Because trauma survivors are like you and me. They wake up in the morning and they decide they're going to be a good husband, a good mother, a good employee. Um, that they're going to work hard today, that they're going to be kind to the people that they meet. And then they go to the grocery store, and the, the little woman in front of, her, uh, in front of the person is, is counting out her pennies to pay for, the, pay for her, her groceries. And the person is, the trauma survivor is late for an appointment. And what's happening is they're perceiving more and more and more threat. 
and they're already overcharged. And so they come up, 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 up and get so charged that they can no longer hold the intention. And they say something sarcastic like, take all the time you need, lady, you know, and come out the side of their neck. Or they just drop their groceries there and, and storm out. They breach their integrity. I'm going to be a good father today, and go, as I talked to an example earlier, and go into their daughter's room and find that it's messy. And How many times have I told you? The uh, husband whose wife rolled her eyes, his intention was to be loving kind to his wife. He got blown out and could not. And, and instead of being aggressive, he was avoidant that he breached his integrity. His integrity was to be present, loving, kind husband and father. His integrity was breached. How frequently do you think trauma survivors breach their integrity? It's pretty constant. It's ongoing. And what happens over time when a person is consistently and habitually in breach of their integrity? One is they get symptomatic, and I didn't go looking for that, but that's a blind pig finding an acorn in the mud. That's interesting to me. And, you know, dissertations can be written on that about uh, when you start looking at that somebody who willfully and habitually lives in violation of their integrity, shouldn't they be in some pain? To me, it seems like that that's evidence of a structured and ordered universe. <clears throat> it's kind of a chicken or an egg thing, but it certainly makes good sense of, of path pathology that if, if, if I am in a constant violation of my integrity, I should be experiencing some discomfort. Otherwise, why would I change? But what do you suppose chronic an habitual violation of one's integrity does to the psyche and spirit of a human being. It produces self-hatred. It produces self-contempt. It produces a state of being where I cannot trust myself to do the right thing. It produces an antagonistic relationship with oneself. And by definition, I think that is demoralization. And that's what trauma does. In addition to all the other symptoms, is that it makes a person living in accordance and alliance with their own principles impossible. <clears throat> and the only meaning until a person learns about the autonomic nervous system functioning and learns how to regulate it the only meaning that they've got to make sense of why I can't do why I cannot be a nice person is because something's wrong with me I'm damaged I'm broken I'm evil I'm wicked I still know that there's very much I ever do <clears throat> as a clinician than getting to facilitate the healing of that with my clients. And that's what this book's about. And that's what this process is about. And I want to share it with you. It's, it's really simple. It's, it's all the stuff that you've already learned. We just add one little piece to it. Everything that it, it, it is teaching, it's building therapeutic relationship, positive expectancy, teaching about the autonomic nervous system functioning, teaching them to, to uh, regulate uh, self-regulate through interoception and acute relaxation. And then pairing that with the, the structuring of their intentional morality. And then helping them live with, in accordance and alliance with it. It's pretty simple. So let me walk you through that. <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to start with that as a standalone treatment, because you can use this is what's exciting. I didn't go looking for this, but you can use uh, forward-facing trauma therapy and in three different ways. It, it, it applies itself to three different 
<coughs> kind of intentions of treatments for three different things and a way to determine which way you're going to use it uh, a nice uh, instrument to use is the satisfaction with life scale. Uh, it was developed by Ed Diener in 1985. He gave it to the public domain, so you're welcome to use this. It's a simple little, I use this as an outcome measure. Um, it's a nice tool, and what's, what's cool is that um, uh, Diener did convergent validity with a whole bunch of instruments, so with the general health questionnaire, the symptom checklist, a bunch of other ones, is that it's, a really, it's only five questions, but it's pretty powerful. Um, and uh, it's useful and it's quick, simple. It's five questions, there they are, and I'm gonna ask you to answer these questions that are up there on your screen. In most ways, my life is close to ideal. From, from one to strongly disagree, to seven, strongly agree. The conditions of my life are excellent. Strongly disagree, strongly agree, or somewhere in between. I'm satisfied with my life. So far, I've gotten the important things I want in life. And five, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. And when you answer those questions and you add them up, you're going to come up with a number between five and 35. Five's the lowest you can get. 35 is the highest you can get. Now, when you look at the results here, the table is, is the way that, that Diener has um, kind of stratified these scores, uh, 25 to 31, extremely satisfied, 26 to 30, satisfied, 21 to 25, slightly satisfied, 20, neutral, uh, 15 to 19, slightly dissatisfied, 10 to 14, dissatisfied and five to nine, extremely dissatisfied. Well, what I've done is stratified these scores into three different categories. And so, and, and these are the different ways that you can use forward-facing trauma therapy. So with folks that have scores of a lower than 15, then you're gonna be use, using forward-facing trauma therapy primarily as a safety and stabilization you're going to be leaning heavily on the, the self-regulation component of helping them to be stronger, faster, smarter, uh, improve performance, diminish symptoms. That is the purpose of, of that for, for patients who have, you know, and also you think about the, the correlation with the TRS, they're going to have low TRS scores also. Uh, <clears throat> with folks that have scores between, between 15 and 25, then those folks are doing, you know, they're moderate, they're in the middle. So this is both coping and enhancing resilience. So we're, we're, instead of with the first group, we're treating symptoms. Second group, we're treating symptoms and enhancing quality of life. Third group, from 26 to 31 to, th to 35, we are optimizing. We're helping them to develop excellence and grace in the situations of their lives, to, to get more fine and more intentional in every little um, mindful activity of their lives. So there's three different kind of ways that you can use this. And you can take, do your scores and then think about how you want to apply this in your life if you're interested in doing it. So, forward-facing trauma therapy happens in three phases. Uh, the first phase is uh, well, built, predicated on a platform of a good therapeutic relationship. And one of the things that I wanted to say before I go any further is that forward-facing trauma therapy does not require, and, and this is part of, of a vision, it's a grandiose vision that I have, and I'll share it with you. Part of the reason why I did forward-facing trauma therapy is, is forward-facing trauma therapy is implementable peer-to-peer. -peer. You do not have to have an advanced degree to help people to, to coach people to write their intention and then to help them to live intentionally by confronting perceived threats with a relaxed muscle body. There's nothing clinical in that. A pastor can do that. A teacher can do that. A friend can do that. 
a parent can do that with a child, is that this is the possibility. It is an articulation of my vision it, that it won't happen in my lifetime, but sometime in the future, I hope that what 12-step fellowships have done for addiction and alcoholism is that forward-facing trauma therapy and some future permutation of it does for trauma, of making trauma treatment a peer-to-peer -peer process, peer-led, peer-driven. There'll still be room for mental health professionals in that because we'll be doing all the memory processing, but this is something that can run ancillary and that is not addressing the past, it's addressing quality of life. And in that process of building quality of life, intentional living, you heal trauma. <clears throat> so I'll typo in my, um, in my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, adduction is really education. And you know what's, there are a lot of downsides from having grown up in an area where the mean A score is 6.2, where the, the median uh, death age for men is 53 years old, uh, in the bosom of Appalachia, in southern West Virginia. But it's also got its perks, and so that when I do something like a, 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 a blatant misspelling there, I can say, I'm, I'm from West Virginia, and there's kind of a, oh, that's okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim that right now. So I um, apologize for the, for the uh, spelling error. Forward-facing trauma therapy happens in three three stages and the first stage is education and skills building and we've done that um, that is the tools for hope that is teaching the, your your clients about the autonomic nervous system perceived threat first and then the uh, autonomic nervous system functioning and then teaching them to regulate that autonomic nervous system functioning and then helping them to practice and develop mastery with with skills development for self-regulation and then the second part is constructing intentionality, getting intentionality into words. It's the first time you heard that. Um, I'll say that a whole lot more in the next half an hour, is that is what you have to have in order to live an intentional life. You gotta get intention out of implicit, inchoate, into language and explicit. And so that means doing some contemplative writing and that also means making a declaration. And then it's once again that there's no, you see here, um, there is no technical mental health stuff going on. And then the final stage is coaching. It's, it's helping your client set up a, a, a strategy, a process of, of going out into their lives and finding the things that they perceive as threatening and to begin to confront those things in a relaxed muscle body. And that's it. Th that's, that's all there is to forward-facing trauma therapy. It's really simple, but it's also really, really potent. So the stuff of the, um, of the uh, educational phase is teaching them about those are all the components of that. Um, I'm going to add a section onto this course. Uh, I'm not releasing it straight away uh, with it, but um, I'm going to come back in probably a month or so and, and insert in the Tools for Hope component um, and bring forward uh, Porges' work on the polyvagal theory. Uh, I want to do a little bit more work around that and get that nice and succinct because I don't want to go way off into, if I did it today, I would be doing it a lot more theoretical and I want to, to turn it into how do you use polyvagal theory in, um, in, in treatment. But it's a, it's a little bit different um, 
21st century view of the autonomic nervous system. And for those of you that are interested in looking at it, um, then I would, I would address, uh, direct you to Stephen Porges' work. And once I've taught them that stuff, I make sure they see this Yerkes-Dotson curve. And if you'll notice on the Yerkes-Dotson curve, as we talked about yesterday, I added this little piece here. And you see that on the left-hand side is intentionality, the right-hand side is reactivity. And that has been really good language for me to help my clients talk to understand this, is that every behavior is either intentional or reactive. And instead of good, bad, right, wrong, uh, positive, negative, getting out of those values, is this what you intended or is this was this a compulsive action and we want to do less compulsive and more intentional that's that's the focus of forward-facing trauma therapy and to explain that process through the lens of Yerkes Dotson so that you got Yerkes Dotson now to refer to oh you're over on the right hand side let's get you back on the left hand side you're in reactivity let's get you back over to to intentionality and then the skills building and we've done all of that you've learned all of these these different uh, capacities for acute muscle relaxation to move from the right hand side to the left hand side of Yerkes Dotson curve to affect self-regulation now the what you haven't learned and what for those of you that are watching this that are interested in putting this into practice then I've included all of those those uh, resources in the link under this under this module, and um, I've been I've been wishy washy back and forth between is it the writing of two documents or is it the writing of three documents? In the book I've got three. Um, here I have two. Uh, the two that are absolutely crucial, and then the one that is optional. The two that are crucial, that are required is the writing of a covenant or a mission statement, whichever you want to call that, and the writing of a code of honor. Now, a covenant, a mission statement, is the statement of your purpose. Why are you alive? What's your purpose here? For the rest of your days, what is your mission, your purpose? And I think I told you about um, uh, mentioned previously in this course, Eric Greetens, who's one of my, uh, I think he's somebody to watch. He's an ex-Navy SEAL. He uh, was a Rhodes Scholar, and he's now the governor of Missouri. And he wrote uh, a wonderful book a few years back. I think it was 2008 or 9 that he published it. It was a bestseller, um, and it was called Resilience. And one of my quotes one of the quotes from that book that I just love is he says that the reason why you are suffering is because you don't know what you're doing here. And he, he spends a lot of time in that book talking about how important it is to have mission. That without mission, that with mission, you are attached to something greater than you. And your attachment and desire to serve that thing that, that is greater than you, whether that's God, whether that's principle, whether that's, that's your ancestry, whatever that is, that gives you the wherewithal to walk through hardship. It, 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 it immediately increases your resilience and your strength to be able to, to tolerate discomfort for the outcome of having, having fulfilled your mission. When people don't have mission, then they get a hangnail and they get overwhelmed. So part of what this writing exercise is, is to help your client clarify mission. And it's a, it's a set of, of exercises of what I call contemplative writing. I ask them to take 60 to 90 minutes of, of, of time, of spending, uh, over the evening, sometime over the next week when I do this in session, I give them the exercises and I say, I'd like for you to take at least 60 minutes of time and do some writing. And decide 
what you want to keep from your past and what you want to change. But I'm going to ask you to articulate why you're here on this planet and what you're going to do for the rest of you. What, what are you dedicated to? What is it that you want to achieve? What do you want to serve? What do you want to be? What do you want to make with your life? And I'm going to ask you to write that. And then secondly, I give out a, a template, and you, you probably already opened it and looked at it, that has a, a set of principles. And I ask my clients to select six to 12 of those principles that become the points on your moral compass. They're principles. They're things like compassionate, uh, thrifty, um, conservative, uh, warm, relational, um, strong, resilient. You know, those, those principles that, that organize your behavior so that you can look through the lens of that and see whether or not is this in alignment with my integrity. And what I ask my clients to do is to write those two documents and then bring them back in to a session with me and then I set up the video camera and I record them making that declaration and because I've helped people for a whole lot of years live intentional lives and what I found is the writing of it while it's essential you gotta get you have to get the intention and the language because when you walk into those situations and especially high demand you gotta be able to talk to yourself and say how do I want to be when people are being aggressive towards me how do I want to be when I'm watching everybody believe something different than me. And hopefully you decide you want to be true to your principles. And to be true to your principles, you have to know what your principles are. So that's what this process is, is clarifying it. And, and while writing them is essential, writing them is an academic exercise. And what happens when people just write their covenant and their code of honor, they have a tendency to forget about it. That's why I facilitate people reading, sharing with, having it witnessed, de declaring. And once that's shared and witnessed, what happens is it, it gives it life inside. That the person starts thinking about it. After they've shared it, the next, you know, for the next days, they are, they kind of, it's intrusive in a good way. That they're thinking, am, am I following this? Am I, am I living close to this? And what also happens is that after they've shared it, they start seeing, oh, this isn't, perfectly right and they start crafting and f um, um, adjusting and making it fit them better and usually most people's covenant and code of honor mission and code of honor go through three or four different iterations before it is before it becomes gelled Mine for, certainly went through a, a bunch of them. And then I, I, once, they, once they've recorded that, I send them home, send that home with them. And uh, the SD card, and I ask them to watch that with acceptance, compassion, and curiosity. And then they come back for the next session. And what do we do? Well... I start asking them, we start finding the places where they are in habitual breach of their integrity. Where do you find yourself either by, I, I separate these between commission and omission. Commission is where you're coming out the side of your neck, where you're being aggressive, critical, harsh, snarky, mean. Omission is where I'm being avoidant, sneaky, trying to get out from under things instead of stepping to them and so that we can we can breach either or both ways and so I start asking my clients where do you find yourself in habitual breach of what you've written here on your covenant and your code of honor and then I show them 
this, this next slide. And I walk them through about what's going on. And I say, I want to show you an example of how this works in my life. So, and, and I'm doing this with, in my relationship with my significant other. So how do I want to be with her? Well, I want to always be loving and supportive. No matter how she is, no matter what she's doing, I want to be loving and supportive. And my vision of that, how do I know that I am being loving and supportive? Well, what am I doing? I am listening instead of talking. I am being supportive instead of sarcastic or sardonic. And I am feeling. I'm not faking it, I'm feeling a sense of desire, attraction, love for her. That is what my integrity looks like. But things happen. And I find myself not being that. And some of the common ways in which I am reactive, that I breach my integrity, is I am impatient. I am snarky, I'm resentful, and I'm withdrawn. Those are four, four ways that I am the opposite of loving and supportive, or maybe not opposite, but certainly tangent, and not on alignment with my integrity. So when I'm doing this with my clients, I ask them to do the same thing. I've got a, a template, uh, you also will see that download that, that looks a lot like this. And I have them fill in what is their covenant, their code of honor, what principle that, do they want to live by. I ask them to identify the outcome of what does that look like when you're in that situation being that way. And then what are some of the ways that you find yourself in habitual breach? of that intention. So we fill this out and it's called a reactive to intentional worksheet. It's in your, you can open that up and look at the PDF or, or download it and print it and do it with me if you'd like to. The next thing I do is that we want to back up. And this is the most challenging part. This is where it takes some experience and some skill. And you need to have done this a few times. If you do it with yourself, you're a whole lot better at doing it with others. Is if you back up five minutes, ten minutes, half an hour, ten seconds, there is always something that precedes the, the breach, the commission or the omission. There is always something that you encountered in the world you know, you, you flip the bird in traffic. Well, you didn't flip the bird in traffic because you were driving along the road and, and looking at the scenery. Something happened. Somebody did an aggressive move. Uh, somebody honked their horn at you. Somebody said or did something to you. What was the sensory thing that happened that caused, that, that I won't say cause is the wrong word, that, that uh, triggered, elicited these omissive or commissive uh, breaches of your integrity. And to get a little more, more subtle, you know, usually when I'm starting doing this with my clients, we start with overt behaviors, things which are videotaped. So if I could see, if I could, if I could videotape you in violation of your intention of being compassionate, what would you be doing? So we want to start with overt behaviors. As we get better and better at this, we can start to use internal behaviors, which are thoughts, you know, that holding judgment or, or criticism or whatever else that is uh, an internal violation. But you want to start with the easy, quantifiable, uh, really real world, measurable behaviors. And here's where we teach our clients what's really going on is what's happened when that person has honked their horn at you or the woman is counting her pennies in the grocery store or you get the bill 
from your insurance company and your premiums have gone up 25 percent and you start coming out the side of your neck and, and yelling at your children those are not the cause those are the triggers why what's going on well you're perceiving a threat you're perceiving a threat when the person honks their horn you're perceiving a threat when the woman is counting her pennies you're perceiving a threat when you get the 25 percent more insurance premium and your body's doing what a body's supposed to do it's charging you up with energy and you are rapidly losing neocortical functioning and phew, a lot of times that happens in, in just a, just a heartbeat doesn't it and that once once the energy's gotten up above threshold then you are compelled against your will to act out aggressively or avoidantly you don't have choice anymore is that when you've when you've let that space get all the way closed you cannot do you can't by an act of will stop yourself you will act aggressively or avoidantly in that situation. It's compulsivity. So are you in danger when somebody honks their horn at you? Rarely. Are you in danger when the woman's counting her pennies at the, at the grocery store? Nope. I forgot what the, the third one was. Um, uh, uh, whatever that situation was, uh, are you in danger? Uh. No, you're not. But So why would you perceive it as threatening? Well, the same reason that my client who locked himself down in his basement for fear of putting his hands on his wife perceived her rolling her eyes at him as a threat. It's because of painful past learning intruding into the perceptual system of the present causing you to perceive threat where there is no danger. And with that perceived threat comes the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And whoa, it inflames, it gets up so high so fast, then you lose neocortical functioning and you can't stop. Now that's an important piece of learning for somebody who is in habitual breach of their integrity. Because what it does is it is now a pardon. This is no longer a moral condition. Once the person gets that, it is no longer morality. It is, it, it is biophysics. This is a biophysics problem. This is not a morality problem. You don't have morality when you're jacked up. You only have survival. So how do you heal that? Well, it ends up being pretty simple, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm a one-trick pony. Sorry about that. Um, that. That when we now use what little bit of neocortex we got, you know, as that space is collapsing, as we use the little bit of neocortex that we got, we go, wait a minute, Eric, what did he say? Oh, yeah, stop squeezing my cheeks together. And I don't mean these. And release the muscles of my, my core muscles. Woo, space widens back out immediately. I'm in a comfortable body. Immediately. One second. Ah, I'm comfortable. Boom. The compulsivity is gone gone. I do not need to do anything now. All I can, I can sit there behind the wheel and watch the person honking his horn at me and flipping me off and I don't have to do anything. They're over there. I'm, I, you know, if one of us have to have a bad day, it's better you than me. Seems to me that's, that's maturation. And if you're going to play in the mud, I don't want to get down there in the mud and roll around with you. That you can, you can have all of it you like. I'm going to stay up here dry and warm and happy and as I stay in a relaxed muscle body then what I can do is that I am now able to come back I've now got a neocortex and I can remember oh what is my integrity how do I want to be while I'm driving and somebody is flipping me off you know let me just wave. How do I want to be when a woman is counting her pennies at the cash register and I need to be somewhere else? Well, huh. What do I have to be grateful for right now? Instead of look at how 
Look at how bad my lot is. I'm stuck in a grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> Look at how great things are. I'm going out and getting in my car and I'm driving to my house and I've got enough money to pay my bills. And, you know, this is pretty, this is a pretty nice set of problems to have is that I need to wait 30 more seconds before I can get out of the grocery store. I'm saying that as problems go, that is a pretty good one. Um, that it doesn't require all of that energy. It's not helping me. And I can now access and utilize my neocortex. And if you'll remember from, from at the beginning of this course with the, the portfolio, when I relax in the context of the trigger, then all I am healing all of the painful learning from the past that caused me to perceive this thing, the, the sensorially similar painful learning that this thing here in the present is, is similar enough to that it's activating that perceived threat here in the present. As I relax in the context of the thing in the present, I am healing, I am diminishing the intensity by the principles of reciprocal inhibition, relaxation and, and exposure. I'm diminishing and healing my history in real time. And let me just take this one step further. Some of you have read about epigenetics and intergenerational trauma. My mother was one of the most traumatized people that I've ever met. She couldn't get in a car without, without being twitchy. She was scared, and for good reason. She had a really traumatic life, a really traumatic development. I believe that I had PTSD in utero. I was born with PTSD, I believe that. And when I confront the situations of my life in a relaxed muscle body, not only am I healing the primary, secondary, and environmental learnings of my own life and desensitizing all of that trauma of my past, making it less intrusive. I'm also, as I confront the perceived threats of my life here right now today, I'm also healing my mother's life and my grandmother's life. And I'm healing the whole intergenerational legacy of pain all the way back to the beginning. And what I've said is that it goes no further, is that I am no longer a transmitter of intergenerational trauma. It stops here. And that's, that's kind of heady. That's rich. Is that we get to heal our planet. I mean, the best thing that I can do to make this world a better place is to not be spewing more of the trauma around and to clean up my side of the street and to, re and to make certain that I'm not contaminating others with my trauma. That's, that's not nothing. And I hope that's a little bit intriguing for you. And as I continue to practice that, then the reactivity is gone. Oh, I forgot to I forgot to, to talk a second about what, what is the trigger? What is it that I encounter for me in my life? Is one of the big triggers for me is when I hear Margie tell me, Eric, you need to, or Eric, you should. And I immediately inflame. Am I in danger? When the person that I love tells me I, sh I should do something or I need to do something, no, zero, zero. So why would I perceive her telling me you need to? You think I have any painful learning with hearing those words? Yeah. And for those of you who are familiar with attachment trauma, that that's, there was a lot of attachment trauma in that. Instead of, instead of my caregivers kind of getting into my world and, and helping me to understand what was going on with me, they were telling me what I needed to do to make their lives 
easier and more 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 um, uh, expeditious. And they did the best they could. I'm not. I'm not indicting them for that. But there was a wounding that happened with me then. It was painful, and it happened a lot. And you know what it was was that that I was not important. That their agenda was important, and that the attachment bond was lost in that. And it hurt. I didn't ask for it to hurt. I didn't know how to be anything other than hurt. Today I can, but I didn't as a child. And so there's lots of those experiences that when I hear that from her, whew, there's an immediate inflaming. And it doesn't matter how much I, I want to say that that's, that's not a big deal, that as, I, as you learned earlier, that's bypassing the neocortex. My body's already inflamed. There is already the activation before I'm even, even conscious of it. So as I dial down, I can go, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, of course this is happening. And, I, and what's nice about forward-facing trauma therapy is that the more you practice it, then you can start asking yourself, why am I perceiving so much threat in the context of this thing? You know, why is it that when somebody looks at me like that? Why is it that when somebody gets close to me like that? Why is it when I smell this, I get so whoo, jacked up? And what you're doing now is you're doing narrative processing by yourself. You are now going and finding Instead of looking at that stuff with, oh my God, I don't want to look at that, you're now curiously going, what are the experiences of painful learning that taught me to perceive threat when this thing is happening here? And there's always a narrative that's always there, and you find yourself going, oh, duh, of course I'm going to be perceiving threat here in this situation. That's adaptive. And what you end up with is some self-compassion, and it just dissipates. It's like, oh, yeah. Of course I'm going to perceive threat. There's no danger. Let me relax and kind of move on through this. And, and you're, you're doing that narrative piece without having to pay a psychotherapist fee. And as you continue along that process, you are achieving your vision. And what do you suppose happens when a trauma survivor, hmm, I remember a Vietnam veteran that I had worked with and he was on alert a long-range reconnaissance patrol in Vietnam with uh, with six guys on a fire team and they were coming back they got ambushed and and four of them were killed and there were only two of them left and they hunkered down that night and he was and, and my client was on patrol and the VC walked within 100 yards and it, he said it was really misty but I could see them through the mist and his buddy that had survived was sleeping and hmm, he carried with him for the rest of, of his life until he met me the belief that he was a coward for not engaging them in battle there was like 20 of them it, it, he and his partner would have been dead but the, the, the message that he carried away from that, that conflict was that I'm a coward. And he became so hating of himself, believed himself to be so toxic and bad that he lived in his basement. He would not risk contaminating, hurting his children with his presence. So he avoided them. He would come upstairs at night and he would sit in his daughter's room. And um, watch her sleep. And when we worked through his trauma and he was able to get that differently and start to engage where that was no longer intruding with such intensity that he couldn't tolerate emotional intimacy um, and he got to go watch his daughter graduate from college uh, and that was it was beautiful and what do you suppose happens when a person starts finding themselves 
being able to successfully walk through those situations and hang on to their integrity and get done with it and and be able to see that they didn't violate their integrity and they were able to be successful in being who and how they want to be. What, what impact does that have on the way a person sees themselves in the world? It's pretty potent, isn't it? And I just don't know, man, that there's anything I do that lights me up more than that, of, of getting to facilitate and getting to watch joy on my client's face when they come in and they report to me how they were able to hold on to their integrity. And people who can start to live with integrity and that starts to be important to them, what happens is their narcissism dissipates, that they don't need validation from an external source. And they become more self-efficacious, they become more resilient, and they like themselves. They respect themselves. And that's a, that is healing the moral wound. And that the more the person does that, the more they are healing the trauma of their past. And they're able to, you know, I think I articulated this to you yesterday. I've been, practic I've been engaging in this for, for fift over 15 years. And, and probably when I started on this, I was probably intentional and living with integrity about 10 or 15% of the time of waking consciousness. Today I'm up to probably, I don't know, 75 or 80% of the time. But what's interesting is the internal experience of that is I don't experience myself having integrity 75 or 80% of the time. What I experience myself doing is being on the verge of violation all the time. Because when I come to awareness, I'm jacked up and I'm wanting, I'm feeling the impetus to choke somebody out. And what do I, I don't do that, I don't act on that, but that's how I catch myself. So it always feels a little bit like I've screwed up. But what happens is I, I, I release and I relax and I'm able to now be intentional in that situation. I've caught myself. But it feels like what's happening is I'm failing and I'm failing and I'm failing and I'm failing. I'm just correcting more, more frequently and quick, more quickly. And as I, as I catch myself more quickly and correct more quickly, then what's happening is I am more and more and more successful. It's a little bit paradoxical. Um, but I certainly like myself more than I used to. And, and so that is forward-facing trauma therapy. And, and it kind of is, finishes up with this really, I think, elegant, simple formula for hope is that when I get my intention into words and I pair that intention with when I am aware and conscious of what my intention is and I pair that with a relaxed muscle body I will always be intentional I will never violate my integrity the only t every time I violate my integrity I'm missing one or t one or two or both of those things that they are not together at the same place. When I bring the two of those things together, a relaxed body and my intention into words, then I am always able to be 100% intentional in those situations. And I have a comfortable body and I have maximal motor and cognitive control. I think that's kind of cool. That's really simple stuff and it is earth shaking. <laughs>